Hello, anatomy friends. This is Dr. Alsup, and this is our last video regarding skeletal muscle basics, but it's a big one. We have quite a bit to go through here. And so we're going to focus on the different types of contraction. Generally, we think of only the shortening of muscle as the major contraction, but that's not all. In fact, there's some very other uh, important types of contraction that will play a huge role in terms of the, the function of the musculoskeletal system. We'll talk a little bit about what origin and insertion means. And then last but not least, we'll talk about the separate types of functions of muscles to allow for efficient movement at joints. All right, so I have contraction here in quotation marks. You know that's a, that's a good thing in terms of uh, what do I really mean here? And I, I really want to make sure that you understand that when we talk about contraction, it does not always mean that you're going to see a visible shortening of muscle. Now, I will say when we talk about the actions of muscles, we are obviously talking about that. But there's it's more than just that. There are going to be two major types of muscle contraction. The first is isometric contraction. And this is where the t there is tension generated. But that tension generated is not enough to exceed the resistance of an object, okay? So, and also importantly, very importantly, there is not going to be a change in length, okay? So no change in length. So this image here is an example of isometric contraction. Obviously, you have something going on here. You're holding on to that weight. So there is going to be some contraction on a small scale occurring at this muscle, but it is not causing a change in length, all right? Um, so when you think about like first contracting or maybe picking something up and then you're holding it right there, you can feel, you feel something is going on in terms of your muscle there and it can certainly get worn out with time. Um, and that is going to be that isometric contraction. So not producing an external movement. But I also want to note that isometric contractions are not always just a prelude to an upcoming more visible movement. It um, can be hugely important in terms of stabilizing joints uh, at rest or to allow more effective movements at other joints by stabilizing, say, the shoulder joint to allow a more effective movement uh, happening at the elbow joint. Postural muscles, so the muscles that help keep us upright, are also going to um, very importantly utilize isometric contraction. The other type of contraction is isotonic contraction. And this is where you do see external movement associated with, uh, with the muscles. So that tension or the force of contraction in the muscle remains almost constant while the muscle changes in length. And there are going to be two types of isotonic contraction. So let's talk about each one. In the most simplistic terms, concentric contraction is what most of us think about when we're thinking about muscle contraction. So when I talk about the actions of certain muscles in upcoming videos, I'm talking about their concentric contractions. So say when I say the biceps brachii will flex the elbow, that's in terms of concentric. Usually the other less, um, talked about, but certainly very important, particularly clinically, are going to be the eccentric contractions, <clears throat> excuse me, where the muscle is going to lengthen during contraction. So if you think about, I was picking up a book and now I'm placing it back on the table, that is going to be an example of eccentric contraction, say of that biceps brachii or brachialis muscle. So the tension that's exerted on those cross bridges, those myosin cross bridges resist the movement of a load and it will slow that lengthening process and kind of act as a break oftentimes. So if you're looking at this example of a weightlifter and we're only thinking about this, say, biceps brachii right here, um, which is what this is showing, and it often shows biceps brachii in a lot of these illustrations, they will use concentric contraction in order to lift the dumbbell, that it will reduce the angle right here in terms of the elbow. And they will use eccentric contraction when they're hopefully very carefully lowering that weight 
um, down to the floor or to the table or whatever they are. And that will increase the, el the angle at the elbow joint and lengthen the biceps brachii and that deeper brachialis muscle. Now, which muscles doing the concentric attraction or contraction and which ones doing the eccentric will vary depending on the type of action that's occurring. And most activities will include both. So these are important concepts here. Now, before I move away from these two concepts, I do want to stop for a second. So while I say concentric contraction gets a lot of the glory in terms of that, eccentric contraction is hugely important. And it's because muscle damage is more common or it's more commonly associated with eccentric contractions. So particularly repeated eccentric contractions, such as walking down the hill, like you see here in this uh, illustration here. So you have this heavy backpack and you're trying to keep walking down the hill and you have to consistently kind of have that lengthening type of contraction. Now, the reason behind why eccentric contractions are more common is an area of very heavy research, but it's still not super well understood or there's not really a clear consensus regarding it, but some research posits that this is due to the fact that the sarcomeres in that connective tissue of the muscle are pulling in one direction, while that weight or the load is pulling in an opposite direction. That may more likely cause little mini tears in the actual muscle, or potentially more likely that connect that surrounding connective tissue or the tendons, which take a little bit longer, of course, to, to heal. And that could also be due to overextension of some of those elastic components, uh, those more structural proteins associated with the cell. So eccentric contractions are most often associated with myotendinous injuries. You see this, I have this bolded here. This is an important concept. So even though we'll spend a lot of time on con concentric contractions, I do want you to understand this aspect of eccentric contraction. All right, let's talk muscle attachment sites. Gone are the days where I'm going to have you memorize every single origin and insertion of every muscle, but I will point out some of the, the bigger and more uh, functionally or clinically important ones. So if you hear the term origin, this means the attachment site, the attachment of the tendon to generally the stationary bone. So when you're thinking about a joint, um, generally one, there's, it's going to kind of cross over a specific joint in order for actions to affect it. And so generally you're gonna have an origin on the portion of the, the, the more proximal or superior attachment. And generally that will stay stationary. If you think about flexing your elbow, this portion of the, the tendon is not affecting the shoulder, it's affecting this elbow joint right here. Um, there's been a movement away from the term origin. Um, oftentimes you'll hear the term proximal attachment or superior attachment, depending on the type of muscle. Um, we've been moving towards this in terms of uh, medical education, um, but you certainly will hear the term origin and insertion. So insertion, as you might imagine, is going to be the attachment of the tendon to the movable portion of the bone. So you can see here in this example of the biceps brachii, again, um, its distal attachment is going to be on the radius here. So that tendon is going to attach on the radius. And sometimes you can hear this referred to as distal or inferior attachment. All right. All right. So let's, let's talk about the functional groups of muscles. And there's really four categories of types of actions at a given time. I want you to note that these are all typically happening. There's a lot going on. We don't generally have just one thing moving um, without some type of effect in other regions of the body. Um, but we're gonna simplify it as best we can here. And so we're gonna start with the prime mover. I think generally that's the easiest to kind of conceptualize often, or sometimes you also hear this referred to as the agonist. And the prime mover is the muscle that produces most of the force during a contraction. So for each action at a joint, there are typically more than one muscle that's contracting. You're gonna have um, concentric contraction, eccentric contraction, different types happening, but there's really the one that is going, there's generally just one that's the prime mover. So it is gonna have the most powerful con concentric contractions to allow that movement to occur. In the case of flexion of the elbow, which we keep using as the example, the true um, 
prime mover or agonist is actually going to be the brachialis muscle, which is located deep to the biceps brachii. Oftentimes, in other examples, you'll hear it's biceps brachii, but you're in a real anatomy class now. And so I'm here to tell you that brachialis is actually the prime mover in terms of flexion of the elbow. Um, instead, that biceps brachii, so it's the more superficial muscle here, is actually synergistic um, in terms of flexion of the elbow. And so what does that mean? Uh, it can mean lots of different things. In this specific example, when we're talking about biceps brachii being synergistic, it's aiding or working with the brachialis muscle and flexion of the elbow to allow more forceful flexion. The, the prime mover and the synergistic action doesn't necessarily have to be identical though, um, or redundant as is the case of this in this example. Um, a synergist can also play a role in stabilizing a joint. It can restrict movements in other areas, or it can even modify the direction uh, of movement so that the action of the prime mover is more coordinated or specific. So uh, we rarely get into the nitty gritty in foundational courses such as uh, this one regarding synergistic muscles. Um, so oftentimes we will talk about a muscle's concentric contraction um, is such like flexion. So for biceps brachii, I will certainly talk about how flexion is going to be, flexion of the elbow is important there. Uh, but really it's playing a synergistic role to the prime mover. Occasionally I'll talk about which one's a prime mover and which one's a synergist, but for the most part, we don't get into these specifics here. But I do want you to be aware of this fact. The antagonist is the muscle that opposes the prime mover. So what does that mean? So um, remember that there's generally, and this will come up quite a bit more, there's muscles generally on one side of a bone and on the other side. Um, so you're going to have the, the biceps brachii and the brachialis on the anterior side. And then back here on the posterior side of the humerus, you're going to have the triceps brachii. And so what this does is it plays an antagonist to that prime mover, opposing the prime mover. So what does that actually mean? Well, in some cases it can relax and give the prime mover almost complete control over the action. But really more commonly, you're still going to have maintenance of some tension on that on the joint to play a role in terms of li limiting the speed and the range of the prime mover. It is really important in terms of preventing excessive movement. Um, as mentioned, oftentimes this will avoid joint injury or inappropriate action. So it's more than just trying to stop the prime mover. It most certainly is. And in fact, it sometimes will help facilitate the better movement of that prime mover. Generally, this tends to be a more lengthening type of action. <clears throat> Last but not least, we have fixators, which are muscles that will prevent a bone from moving um, or moving in a particular direction. And this, again, will help to facilitate that prime movement action often. Occasionally, muscles will cross multiple joints. Um, so you don't want, say, a more proximal joint. So the biceps brachii is a good example. It crosses both the shoulder joint and the elbow joint. When that biceps brachii is playing that synergistic role in terms of helping to flex that elbow, you don't want the shoulder joint sometimes moving at the same time. So you can have that portion there contracting and kind of fixing that shoulder joint in order to allow for um, a more prominent flexion to occur at the elbow. Um, in the case here, we have the supraspinatus, which is a rotator cuff muscle, also contracting and trying to help set that shoulder, you know, set it from doing too much movement in order to allow for this uh, more forceful contraction in order to get that water to the mouth and to be able to drink. All right, excellent. So last question in terms of this section, when a muscle stretches, so muscle lengthening, what type of contraction is this? Is it concentric, eccentric, isometric, tonic? And we didn't even mention tonic. A uh, tonic is a type of movement that's in, that can play a really important role. Generally, you have some form of muscle tone, so a very slight amount of contraction happening even in a relaxed muscle. 
Um, so this is not the, the answer here. Don't worry so much about it as we didn't get into much detail there. We know with isometric, we are not, um, that's not correct either, right? So that's not right. We need to be thinking more in terms of these two movements, concentric and eccentric. Concentric, remember, is muscle shortening. So no, no. That leaves B eccentric, um, which will play a role in terms of muscle lengthening, but still you're going to have visible movement occurring. So B eccentric is the correct answer. All right, excellent. Next time we talk, we will be heading into regional anatomy. So we're going to talk about the actual bones, the actual joints, the actual muscles associated with the throughout the entirety of the body. So we have quite a bit to do. Thank you so much in terms of your focus on these foundational concepts. They will help as we move into regional anatomy. Have a great rest of your day and please reach out with any questions.